daft question, I guess. If you couldn't hear, you wouldn't say that you couldn't hear, would you? It'd be fine. Um, my name is Ian Tickle. I look after Domo for Europe. This is Rush Moncur. He works for Ernst & Young previously at SAB Miller. What we thought we'd do this morning is give you a very quick introduction to Domo and how we see the marketplace and the drive for data to take decisions and to make action about the information you have available to you, and then give you a true case story of how Ross drove this change at SAB Miller. And the reason for that is we see a lot of people talking about data, big data, and the insights you can get from that. But part of the skill, part of the benefit is to actually take action. And that's really where Domo came from as an organization. We were founded with a goal, really, to help optimization. We recognized, as Josh James, our founder, by asking a very simple question of our own organization, that there was a big disparity between having information, having data, and having something that you took action against. And the very simple question was, when he was running Omniture, a web analytics company, was, how many people report to me? How many people are in my company? And the answer was, we'll go and run a report. And he's like, this is madness. Why are we running reports about basic information about how we drive business and how we move forward? And if you think about it, though, it's actually a relatively complicated question. Because you're actually asking, how many people are on payroll? How many people are on secondment? How many on paternity leave? How many on maternity leave? How many have joined but haven't yet started? How many have been fired, how many left? How many have resigned? That type of thing. And that meant putting four or five data sources together and creating information and then visualizing it. And he just decided this was just an a, a archaic way of looking at data. You've got this raw data source. We're taking it out. We're putting it into a different system. We're then looking at it and doing some transformation to it to then do a visualize on, visualization on it to answer a question that we've asked. Why don't we just automate that entire process and speed it up so we can give you valuable insight? And that's where Domo really came from. And if you think about reporting on the whole, the, the industry's become obsessed with visualization. It's all about look at this visualization, look at that visualization. When you actually look at a report, you apply in your head a KPI, a metric, a value, a success or failure criteria. So if you have that business insight to the visualization you're looking at, then why don't you just tell a platform to tell you when that takes place? You think about the amount of data points we all have to consider these days. And then the collaboration that you want to have after you take a decision or before you take a decision, it's much easier now to have a look at automating the entire process from front to back, looking at alerting, looking at proactive information so you can manage by exception. So you've got all those reports that you look at, then you decide, actually, do you know what? That's great information. Tell me when something happens. There's no point in me looking at a report when my sales pipeline is down. That's the impact of a different cause. What I want to look at is the causality. So is it my lead flows down? Is it my outreach campaigns aren't working? And if you think about it, that's where you can automate in real time in a far more effective way. So what we did with Domo, we built this platform. And the platform's designed to take the ETL process, take the integration tools, take the analysis, take the visualization, take the collaboration, take the alerting, and then take the storage as well, and all build it into a single environment. The reason we put it into a single environment was for several points. Speed. There's no point doing a load of analysis if by the time you finish the analysis, the data is out of date. The other benefit was volume. People talk about big data, and big data is really subjective. For Domo, big data is how much data do you want to put into us? The platform takes as much data as you want. Currently, we have about 26 petabytes sitting in the system. Um, the largest customer has 90 billion rows that we're analyzing in real time in 0.6 of a second. Very, very high throughput, very high processing. And the beauty with it is for everybody. It's not just for IT professionals to free up your time to do true data analysis. It's not just for the lines of business to see how progress is working inside their accounts and organizations and their particular roles. It works for sales, it works for marketing, it works for operations. And when we talk about size again, size has become a restricting factor to enabling you to take decisions. So if we look at L'Oreal, who's up on this slide, we look at their digital marketing spend. The very simple question from the chief performance officer was, can you tell me the same numbers that what I'm seeing about spend as all my regions have seen about spend? Simple question, right? I just want the numbers to be the same. We take 34,000 data sources every day into Domo, analyze that, and produce some global reporting for its performance. 
that gives you the ability to look at data and decision making in a slightly different way. What I want to do from a customer perspective is it's great me talking about the virtues of why we are and who we do, why we do what we do. But I also wanted to have someone who's done it in real life to give you some insight to that. The journey that people go through and not just understanding the decisions that they want to take, but how do you do that? How do you drive organizational change? And to do that, I'm going to pass it over to Ross, and Ross will take you on that little journey that he went through with SAB Miller. Thank you, Ian. Afternoon, everybody. So until recently, I was um, head of business analytics globally for SAB Miller. Hand up if you've ever heard of SAB Miller. OK, that's more than I thought. So um, the question I want to ask you is, what is a data-driven culture? So we banned this about organizations use it as a uh, a platform, a strap line. We are a data-driven culture. This is what we think a data-driven culture is. It's an operant environment where we seek to leverage data whenever and wherever possible to enhance business efficiency and effectiveness. Easy to say, not easy to do. Ask yourself this question. Really, how data-driven is your entire organization? What would happen? How would you feel? if you lost access to that data, even if it was just for a day, if it was that kind of important, pertinent, real-time data. So this slide did say who are Saab Miller. Saab Miller doesn't exist anymore. Saab Miller was bought by a competitor. So Saab Miller were the second biggest beer company in the world. These are some of the brands. You might recognize some of those. Some of those might even be your favorites. My particular favorite is one on there called Cazelle. So Saab Miller existed in about 70 different countries around the globe. Saab Miller had 260 plus brands. 150 of those were digitally active. The organization had a vision to take Saab Miller from the digital dark ages and become a leading forefront for utilizing digital technology in several different ways. The bit that I was involved in intimately was about understanding how we were using our $1.4 billion that we spent on marketing activity. A part of that, a tiny part of that, at that point, was on digital. Say, between 2 and 5%, depending on what brand. But the ambition was that that would become 25% over the course of five years. So we had this ambition to create a single platform that brought together all of the data sources across our entire digital estate from web and CRM and social um, and social listening and bringing it all into one platform to give access to the people that needed that information in near real time. This meant that we were creating connections to lots and lots of individual data sources across those different platforms, those different 10 plus different data sources and creating one single platform where somebody in Uganda or Australia or Colombia could access the information and look at it in the same way. That meant an awful lot of data connections, over 9,000 data connections that were updated automatically on a daily basis. When we started the project, we envisaged some key challenges that we'd have to overcome. The first of which was aligning to the strategic objectives of the organization. So getting that executive sponsorship, which we, we did get. Also, because of the way that Saab Miller operated more as a federated organization rather than a global top-down organization, at the point in time we were executing this, there was patchy local digital strategy rather than one cohesive global strategy. It was piecemeal access to data. That meant in some places we weren't accessing data at all. In some places we were bringing that in in Excel spreadsheets. In some places it was just PowerPoint reports. We had several versions of the truth. That's kind of an oxymoron, that statement, because there can't be several versions of the truth. Only one of them is true, right? And there was a general lack of analytics talent to do anything with all that data and pull it into some kind of cohesive story that was going to make sense to people in the business. There was insufficient or zero automation. 
weak data literacy within the business team, so an awful lot of reliance on the agencies to provide that information. And this was a bit like agencies marking their own homework, right? We would tell them what we wanted to do, they would design a way of doing it, and then they would tell us how they'd done. So they were marking their own homework. Another key challenge was getting access to this data meant credential management, and there was no centralized way of managing those credentials. In fact, asking some of the brand teams in South Africa or in Peru who had the credentials for a particular brand's access to Facebook, for example, sometimes we didn't even know, let alone we've got it, here it is. There was a distinct lack of accountability for measurement of performance in this area across the business. Now, given that we're spending 5% of our 1.4 billion on this kind of activity, but we're going to ramp up to it being 25%, this is kind of important. And generally speaking, there was a fear of failure and critically a fear of transparency. So brand teams, even brand teams in the same business unit within a country, were quite secretive about what they were doing and how well they were doing against the objectives they set themselves. So we sought to create an environment that would get us to that data-driven culture. And to do that, we needed to do these fundamental things. So change the mindset, provide the tool set, develop the skill set, and connect to and bring together the data set. So this platform that we were going to create, I didn't know about GDPR then. I wouldn't have called it GDRP, trust me, if that was the case. Um, Global Digital Reporting Platform does what it says on the tin. We came up with all sorts of other exotic names, like Prometheus and all this kind of... No, too fluffy, too marketing. Let's just call it what it is. And it was designed to do this, to create that global solution so everybody can access it, that enables a consolidated view across all of those pieces of data in a standardized KPI framework. And that standardization was fundamentally important because we were measuring things in different ways. We're having different discussions about the same thing because we had different KPIs coming from different sources. And it gave us a way of measuring our performance in this critical area that we were going to expand into. If you can't measure it, if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So first step of many was to create a simplified view of what those KPIs would look like. So I lovingly refer to this as the onion, because it looks like an onion. I'm not going to talk you through all the KPIs. But this was a way of simplifying a view across all of those different sources of data, accepting the fact that reach on one platform doesn't equate to reach on another platform, et cetera, but putting it all together and giving a way for the business to talk the same language. And critically, to set objectives and targets using these KPIs in order to inform and measure against in future deployment. So in discussing this with IT, this is the, the exact response I got from our global architecture guy. Yes, data spaghetti, isn't it? Because the concept of putting together all this data from all these different data sources into one platform, providing that information in real time to everybody across the planet in one platform, can't do it. Then we met Domo and figured out we could do it. And this is what that platform delivered to the organization. Critically, comparability and consistent measurement. Real-time availability across all the brands. Transparency, because one brand could see what another brand was doing in terms of activity and how they measured against that activity. That's something they, they didn't have before. One brand couldn't even look across different platforms before and understand whether they were driving the right kind of behavior on one kind of platform versus another. The platform delivered all of that. So in order to make this succeed in an organization like Sam Miller, we needed to follow a path to get us there. And this is the, the way that we went about it. So we needed to deliver a quick win. So we needed to show something very quickly that was of value to the organization in order to get and um, symbiotically live with the executive sponsorship that were required. We developed a team structure around the implementation um, in order to succeed, and we facilitated data-driven meetings. 
So how do we find a quick win? We look for that intersection between something that was highly visible and important to the organization, influential audience. That's from the C-suite right down to individual members of brand teams in all those country organizations. And we needed to do it quickly. We needed someone internally who was going to be the executive sponsor. Um, that was me. I won't tell you too much about that. But essentially, someone within the business, not within IT, who understood cr critically how this was going to benefit the organization in the short and the long term. Someone that truly believed in the value of pulling this data together and the value that data can deliver to the organization. Someone with a connection to the right people in the organization in order to make this happen. So I sat within the organization in, in global marketing, so ultimately reported into the CMO. We reported in and did regular debriefs um, to the CEO of the organization. In, this was a high-profile, um, big-scale project for us. Interestingly, we talk about data as being a value add. Data as being um, fundamental to be able to make decisions. But if you do it incorrectly, data can actually be something that drives ineffective meetings. It takes more time to prepare it. If it's old, it's useless. It's not real time. There can be several versions of the truth. You get conflict. There can be a lack of understanding of what the data actually means. If you haven't got a simplified way of utilizing that information in a KPI structure that makes sense to the organization, and that can lead to indecision, ineffective meetings. So what we were trying to do with this platform was to change the meeting paradigm, to take it from being a high level of effort, a lot of which was about preparation and not enough about discussion and action, to less effort and a lot more discussion and action and less preparation in order to increase the effectiveness of those meetings. So, what I'm going to briefly tell you now is the output of all of that work to get to a platform that enabled us to tell stories using the data. So first of all, quote, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to process it, to extract value from it, to visualize it and communicate it is going to be a hugely important skill in the next decades. It already is. So this is why all the Manufacturing organizations, retail organizations, banking organizations, whatever vertical you're talking about, are obsessed with this kind of ability and capability because it is critically important to us. Now, as human beings, we all love stories. In fact, okay, he's biased, he's a, an author. Philip Pullman says, after nourishment, shelter, and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Debatable. As analytics experts, we love data. We crave data. And Stephen Few says, numbers have an important story to tell themselves. They rely on you to give them a clear and convincing voice. There is a clear connection between those two things. Now, if you're talking about data versus stories, there is a clear winner. The two ways that stories are more convincing and beat dry stats is firstly, they're more memorable, and secondly, they are more persuasive. So why would you merge data and stories together? Why would you think about using this kind of way to get your data utilized in the right way within an organization? Because stories connect with people on an emotional level, and that is actually the way that we sell products we advertise products to people. We use that emotional connection. The factual, logical connection doesn't do it. So the emotional connection is critical. We hear stats, we feel stories. So one way to think about this and how you take your data and make it relevant to the organization and the audience is to think about this structure. A narrative, the visuals, and the data to explain, enlighten, and engage to drive change. So one way of illustrating this 
is to think about the path from data through narrative to story, to your audience. So you explore your data, you glean an insight, you visualize it and explain it in a compelling way, connecting with your audience at an emotional level, and that gives you your data, your narrative, and your visual. But there are other ways of doing this that might result in what we refer to as a data forgery. You might start with your data, explore and get your insight, but if you don't explain it and visualize it in the right way, you end up directly connecting with the audience, and that becomes what we call a data cut. There's data, there's no narrative. The visuals don't there, aren't there to support it. The second way is you start with your story, you look back in the data for what backs up your story, and then you use that to support the outcome. A data cameo, so you've got the narrative, but actually the data and the visual might not support the outcome. And the third forgery is you start off with a visualization. Straight from the data, there is no narrative. So critically, and one of the things that we did really well with the SAB platform was to think about who the audience is. Might be the same data, but there's a different outcome that you're looking for with that data. So for example, our CMO would say to me, Ross, I want to know how we're doing in digital. So I'd scratch my head a bit and go, well, Nick, that's a really hard question to answer because there are so many variables and so many dimensions that we could look at one cut of the data and this brand might be doing really well, look at another cut of the data and this brand might be doing very well. So I suggest that actually what we need to do is understand what the brand's objectives are and measure against that. That's a good idea, he says. So who's the right audience for the data story? And how do you adjust the data to fit that audience? This is a, a, a visual of the, the long uh, lifetime of the projects. I'm not expecting you to read all the, the milestones on here, but critically, the two things I want to call out is we looked for that quick win in the beginning, and then we developed a different way of utilizing the data and visualizing the data, creating a narrative around the data in order to develop those stories for the different people that we were aiming at. One of the things that is critical for success in this kind of environment is collaboration around the data. Within the Domo platform, there is um, a tool called Domo Buzz, which allows you to have conversations within and next to and around the data. Whether it's on your mobile, whether it's on the desktop platform, it generates its own story. So to finish, just a few ways that we ended up looking at the data. Now, bearing in mind there's 300 million rows of data, 9,000 different data sources across 10 or more different platforms for 150 brands in 60 countries, there's an awful lot of data. And any which way to cut it and look at it, we tried and we looked at. First up, rather than just going straight into the data, we signposted it. We created our stories and then we put a signpost to those stories at the very beginning. So this is the splash page. Um, there's a global dashboard, there's a brand dashboard, there's a content dashboard, and there's a competitive dashboard, and all of those are relevant to different people at different times within the organization. So just to give you an idea of what those look like. Now, the way that this looks isn't native to the Domo platform. So what Domo is brilliant at is all sorts of things. One of the things is the time from zero to dashboard is extraordinarily fast. When we first encountered Domo in a meeting, we connected live to some data, and we had a dashboard in literally two minutes, which I was astounded by. It's, a, it's coming from a pre-built, a pre-packaged view of what a dashboard might look like, and then you can customize it and change it and do all sorts of things to it using the native visualizations within the platform. That's all good. That's your quick win. That's your, your starter for 10 out of the gate. But where you want to get to, and what we did was use another fantastic ability of the platform, which is actually to create your own visualizations from a blank canvas, from scratch, which is what these are. You connect into the same data, 
but you're visualizing it in a way that makes sense to your story that you're trying to tell your audience. So this one was something that um, C-suite members, uh, MDs and countries and marketing directors of the planet would use to look at how their portfolio of brands were doing versus other brands in the organization on, a, on key metrics, simple metrics, but ranked on one thing, which was a combination, a composite metric across those KPIs, which made sense to our CMO who's asking that question, Ross, how are we doing in digital? Then within the organization, within a brand team, you want to look at something that's just about my brand. I want to know, for the last month, how am I doing across all my platforms and all my activity against the KPIs that I set myself, my targets. And that's what this did, the brand story, the brand performance dashboard. Again, created from scratch to tell that story to that particular audience. And then another way of looking at it is actually just looking at content. So irrespective of a platform, what content we put out there, how does that measure against those KPIs that we created in that onion? And again, this is a content story for a different audience. One thing I want to emphasize is that the way that we went into this and the way that we succeeded with this was because it, it was viewed as it wasn't a tech project. This wasn't about providing a tech solution. This was about a business change within the organization. And we created a different way of, con of consuming that information that was relevant to the people in the organization at the different points in order to make better, faster, more effective decisions. And five things we learn along the way. You've got to identify the right data, clearly. You've got to choose the right visualizations to fit the audience. You've got to calibrate those visuals to your narrative. Scrape out anything that isn't relevant. Remove the noise to focus the attention on what is important. And that is just a reminder of the importance of the narrative, the visuals, and the data. And those who tell the stories rule the world. Thank you.